Thank you very much. Hi there, everyone. Uh, well, I'm glad that they have the lights on tonight uh, because I just want to tell you guys, I have you all under surveillance right now. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. It's like, boy, if he can watch me, I better be very careful what I'm doing and uh, I don't want to be picking my nose. I don't want to be making obscene gestures. Uh, and most important, you're thinking to yourself, I better look like a busy person because that's who the big ideas are for tonight. Now, you're probably also thinking to yourself, like, I really don't have too much to be concerned about because the surveillance that I'm using are my eyeballs. Uh, and there's limits to what my eyes can do, right? I have to choose, uh, you know, with my visual system, am I going to be looking at the whole room, in which case it's very hard for me to see much detail about what you're doing, uh, or I'm going to have to decide, do I want to zoom in and, and pick out a particular person to look at? Uh, and while I'm doing that, all the rest of you are kind of safe to do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, and that's a limitation of, of my visual system. Uh, and it's a limitation that I think we all have incredibly good intuition for. Uh, and that governs how we think about it when someone is looking out over an audience. Even though I have a perfect vantage point for seeing everyone, uh, that you know that there are limitations that I have. Now, if suddenly I just take my cell phone out with, uh, with my cell phone imager in it, uh, and that has a you know, 1080p video system, suddenly that intuition changes a little bit, right? Now all of a sudden I have a lot more pixels. Uh, I'm recording and I, and I could go back and look at it after the fact. Uh, it changes what we think about for a visual system. What I'm gonna talk about tonight are some other visual systems uh, that, that people deploy, uh, sometimes for emergencies, sometimes for surveillance, uh, and some of the ones that we've built uh, where I work, which is MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Just like I said with my eyes, uh, you know, when, when people design video surveillance systems, they, they look at a site, this is uh, Foley Square in New York City, uh, and they deploy their cameras, they, they set them up in a way that, uh, that gives them the coverage that they need. And if you have a big area to cover, you need a lot of cameras. Uh, and you can see on the right-hand side that, that these four fields of view, you know, it's very difficult to figure out how they all fit together. Uh, what's more, uh, you, know, you can see that a typical display room, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, for a user to, to bring all of that information together and to have a coherent picture of what's going on. And, uh, and that makes it a, a challenging thing. Uh, we've been working on a system uh, that we call ISIS or Chandelier. Uh, it's actually a camera system that has 48 uh, cell phone type imagers in it. Uh, which adds up to 240 megapixels. Uh, what this does is instead of having to choose your camera fields of view and panning and tilting and zooming, uh, this camera system looks everywhere over 360 degrees simultaneously. Uh, and it can actually give you up to 1.2 centimeter resolution at, at, uh, at, uh, at 100 meters uh, away. Uh, now that's a tricky thing to do. Uh, that's a lot of data because we're showing this at video rates, 240 megapixels at 10 frames per second. Uh, that's a lot of storage to store it all the way. Uh, and then the most important part is how do I take all of this information and actually put it together in a way that, that someone can actually use it and comfortably go through all of that, uh, that, that video information and, and make productive use of it. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. I should tell you that uh, one of these systems is actually deployed in Terminal A uh, in Logan Airport. So if you've been through Logan, you've probably be, been imaged by one of the early uh, predecessors of the system. Uh, and let me just give you an idea of how it works. So what we do is we take all of those imagers that you saw and we stitch them together into a fisheye view. Seeing here is on the left, you, you see the entire 360 degree field of view. If you look carefully, you can actually see that there's a tower that this is mounted on. Uh, and what's happening is this little view is showing you what's being viewed is a small section on the right. All of those cameras are seamlessly integrated into one view. Uh, and then this allows us to actually, uh, you know, to, to go through the imagery. And the user feels like they're controlling a virtual camera by walking through all of those uh, views. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, that you, know, you can control a camera manually, or alternatively, you can put a box around a, a particular object that you want to track, and you can have it automatically uh, track and follow the, uh, the, the vehicle or, or the, the thing that you'd like to be able to, uh, to see. Uh, there's even more that we could do. I don't think I'm going to have time to tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. S same principle, question is either side. Uh, 
this, this technology was not being used down in Boston this time last year when the marathon was take, taking place, I think. That's correct. This was not being used, uh, though if you're at the finish line this year, uh, you will see, uh, if you look around and do your own surveillance, you're going to see a, that uh, in two locations this uh, camera system is actually deployed this year. So it, will, it is being deployed this year? It is being year. deployed this year. And how much difference do you think it would have made last year? I mean, the. The suspects in the bombing were identified quite quickly using, I believe, private video that people were just spontaneously recording at the scene. Yeah. So um, I think that the, the way that it would, you know, the, the con ops would be that, uh, that you know, if, if something terrible happens like an explosion, uh, that would be a good reason to go into the video. You would know exactly where to look and when in that video stream. Uh, you could go backwards and see all of the things that led up to the event of that explosion, and then you can actually take it forward and watch to see where people go afterwards. And that could be done virtually in real time, and, and I think you know, on a tactical timeline as opposed to the, very much of the forensic uh, thing that you saw happen, which took days to, to kind of compile and okay. bring about a solution. Thank you. Questioner over here. Would it be possible to deploy this technology in an airline cockpit or in an airline cabin? And why do you think we haven't done that yet? Uh, I, I think that uh, putting video in, in buses and, and uh, airliners, uh, you know, I know in buses that it, that it has been done in many cities around the country. Uh, airliners, uh, you know, the, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if many airliners do have cameras. Uh, it's a much more contained space, so it, it really doesn't require anything quite as fancy as this, where we're trying to look over a wide extended area, and that really drives the pixel counts and, and the complexity of the system. But, uh, the, so no it may be happening be to a degree, but you don't need something quite as sophisticated Correct. as this. Okay. Question over here. Yes. Uh, question is, how is this going to be impacted in the legal process against the right of privacy? Yeah. So uh, if, if you look at the title of my talk and, and the limited time, uh, you know, I, I actually think a lot about that issue. And, and I'm happy to say that, uh, that, that so do the people that I work with. And we're, we're constantly asking ourselves, uh, you know, it's easy to come up with scenarios where this makes a lot of sense and we all stand behind it. Uh, you know, if a bomb goes off and we want to find the perpetrator of that bomb, they harmed a lot of people and it's very clear that, uh, that this is a technology that we all feel comfortable employing. And then we can all think of much more nefarious ways that this technology can be employed as well. Uh, the main thing I would say is that uh, in talking to a lot of people, everyone has a different set point of where we cross that line between you know, an invasion of privacy and a very useful tool. Uh, and what I find very handy is to, is to have a lot of discussions about that, and, and, and I think it is, even on a national level, is something that we have to do a lot of thinking and talking about. Thank you. Over here. How do we recognize when we're the subject of surveillance? Like walking through Harvard Square, how do we know where there are cameras, and, and how do we become alert to that? Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess the short answer to that would be that you should probably assume there's enough cameras out there that, uh, that you're always under some form of surveillance. Uh, so, and, uh, and I think, you know, to be fair, I mean, that's been true throughout history. I mean, the, the technology has changed, the quality of that surveillance has changed, but it, even the way I started the talk tonight, uh, you know, I'm looking at you right now and people have been looking at each other for a long time, so I, I think, you know. Please, over here. Yeah. So in terms of cost efficiency, like I know that one of these cameras can replace several other cameras, but how much more expensive is it than a regular security camera? So, so at Lincoln Lab, uh, you know, we're, we're in the business of building first-of-a-kind prototypes. Uh, the cameras themselves are based on uh, cell phone imagers, which cost on the order of tens of dollars a piece. And there's really no reason in principle that those cameras couldn't be, uh, couldn't be built for you know, some multiple that's even less than the cost of cell phone cameras. Uh, a lot of the... The cost that, that drives our systems is in the disk drives and the, and the processing units that allow us to exploit that data, because it is a lot of data that we're collecting simultaneously. But, uh, but the cost could be made very low in a production system. Please, over here. Uh, how long do you think it'll be until this technology is widespread? Uh, the, the one that I demonstrated tonight, uh, there are actually uh, companies that are interested in licensing it and, and working on licensing right now. Uh, one of the things I didn't get to talk about is it's not just for surveillance. Uh, but you could imagine this uh, being used in, say, a sports venue. Uh, and you know, imagine this at the, uh, at the Boston Garden. I had a slide for this, which I never got to. Uh, but <laughs> instead of watching how a cameraman decides to point his camera, uh, like this guy is doing over here, you could have your own virtual camera, and you could be filming and watching in real time your own Celtics game. Uh, there could be multiple cameras, but you could be the cameraman. Uh, that might be a pretty exciting future for this type of technology. 
Okay, I, I'm sorry, but we're going to run out. Of, okay, thank you very much, Larry. <laughs>